uh, I'm Nathalie Denoblet, I'm a climate scientist, I'm a physicist. I've been involved in the last uh, IPCC report. I guess IPCC means something for you. Okay, good. <laughs> That's a good start. Uh, okay, and I'm going to, to talk a little bit about uh, the state of our knowledge in the climate science. So those two curves, you might have already seen them on your right hand side. You have the time evolution over the last 2000 years uh, of the global Earth temperature. So those are expressed in anomaly. So it's a different every year between the temperature of the year and the temperature at the end of the 19th century. And what you see is for, for 2000 years, there was almost no climate change, no variations except some interannual variability from one year to another one. Uh, you had no change in the global earth temperature and suddenly in 1850 you have a sudden rise of uh, the global <coughs> earth temperature and that curve is known as the hockey stick uh, curve because it really looks like a, like a hockey stick. And on your left hand side, uh, I'm going to have problems. On your left hand side, you have the same uh, type of curve, but for three main greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which are CO2, um, CH4 and N2O. And they say they show the same stability for almost 2000 years and then a sudden rise after 1850. So that's just to show where we are in measuring uh, atmospheric greenhouse gases and measuring the temperature of our planet. And what you need to know also is that the, the Earth already had a very high CO2 temperature. Today we are at 420 ppm, I think, parts per million. But this was more than five, uh, about five million years ago uh, when uh, there was no human on, on the planet. So, what, so, 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 so this, this curve is, um, is really the, mani the manifestation of the global warming that you heard about. We are going to talk a little bit about this global warming and, and uh, we are gradually co going to come and, and explain why humans are responsible for that. What you need to know about global warming is that it's not homogeneous in time. Although in the newspapers you always hear about the 1.5 target, the 2 degrees C target, we are at 1.2 degrees C warming since 1850, but this is a, a global number. It means nothing for us. It doesn't mean anything, okay? Uh, just, just to see whether you have any idea of that, did you hear about the last glacial maximum? that occurred 20,000 years ago. So it was a glacial time of the planet uh, where uh, the sea level was 120 meters lower than today. So you had many land out of the sea. So it was really a very cold period. You had 3,000 meters of ice sheet in the North Canada, Alaska, England and Scandinavia. So that's a totally different world. Do you have any idea of what was the different temperature, the temperature difference at the global scale compared to today? It was about four or five degree colder, yeah. And it was a totally different planet. And now we are talking about, so it was, it was four degree colder 20,000 years ago, okay? And to go from this minus four degree to what we have today, it took 20,000 years. And now we have done, done 1.2 in 150 years, and we may, do, we may do plus three degree in 250 years. <coughs> so the time scale is completely different. Yes? That's what we are going to, to, to see, okay? <laughs> that's, what, but that, that's a very good question. It's just, but it's, it, it's just to, to show you that, that it's very small at the, at the planet scale. It seems insignificant. You say, well, well, 
plus two degree every day? Is it really, does it really matter? And it's not that it's not plus two degree every day. It's very different. So one difference is that it's not homogeneous in, in space. Okay, so the warming is highly heterogeneous in space. And what you see here is how this 1.1 degree C global warming uh, manifests itself at different places in the planet. So what you see is that the oceans are on the, on the, on the left-hand side of the, of the color scale, so they are colder than the global lands. So in fact, the oceans do warm, but at a slower pace than the globe. The land is always above one. So the land, when, when the globe warms by one degree, parts of the land can warm by two degrees. So the land warms faster than the globe. And then if you look from the equator to the pole, the pole are warming much faster than the equator. And this is because we have, we have ice effects in the pole, polar regions, we have snow effects in the polar regions, and when you melt the ice and the snow, it gives additional heat to the system, it absorbs much more heat, so it, it warms much faster. So in some areas, in the high northern lands, we are already at plus seven degree. Okay, so that means that there are processes that cannot occur anymore and that are changing the local climate. So there is a very high heterogeneity in space. In France, for those who follow, uh, at least for the French people who follow the weather service, in, 22, in 2022, in June 28 exactly, the climate normals changed. So anytime you listen to a weather report, wherever, I mean in France, but also in whichever country you, you, you live in, you s the, 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 the weather uh, panelists tell you it's X degree below normal or minus two degree above, uh, plus two degree above normal or minus two degree above normal. A normal in the climate system is an average over about 30 years. You need to have 30 years to, because one month of July does not re resemble the one of the year before and the one of the year after. So that's what we call interannual variability. That's purely natural. And so if you want to have a long term and, and really think about climate, you have to average over many years. And that is about 30 years or more. And what happens is that in the, after 1950, the weather uh, um, uh, modelers re realized that as climate was changing, the normals were changing. And you are not going to use the same normal for a kid who is born 10 years ago and for his grandpa who was born more than 60 years ago. Okay, it's not the same normals anymore. So a summer for a kid who is born 10 years ago is not the same normal summer, it's much hotter, than the one his grandpa uh, um, uh, no, knew uh, 60 years ago. So every 10 years, the weather normals are changed so that you are upgrading this. And I guess it's the same every, in every country of the globe. And that's a, a, a sort of manifestation in our society of this climate change. And in France, what you see is that the, the mean warming in France is almost two degrees C. So really, the, 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 the globe, the France is warming faster, as do more lands, is warming much faster than the globe, which, because the globe during the same decade has risen by a little bit less than 1.2 degrees C. So it's getting warmer in France than it is um, in the globe. Another way is that the season of the strongest warming, and this is where we come to the plus two degree is not the same. The season of the, of the biggest or strongest warming is not the same, depending on where you are. And if you just look at France here, uh, you see that the season of the strongest warming around the Mediterranean is summer. In the middle of the France, it's winter and the high northern uh, part of France, it's spring. And that also is important because if you uh, warm a, a season more than another one, the living 
uh, on Earth is not going to react the same way if it's warmer uh, in winter or if it's much warmer in, in summer. So that's also very important. So there is uh, heterogeneity in the timing of this warming. And of course, the most, um, the thing that you feel the most is the extreme weather events and the extreme heat events. Okay, and that's what you show here. You see the globe divided in small hexagons. And this is West and Central Europe, for example. And if this hexagon is pink, it means that we have observed large increases in the warmer events, the temperature of the warmer events, or the number of heat waves, etc. So we are just looking here at the hot extremes. When you have dots, the dots means that we attribute this increase in the hot extremes to human activity, so to global warming. We'll come back to the attribution uh, later, but to, human, uh, to, to, the, to the observed global warming. So we warm the climate and we have, as a consequence, warmer hot extremes. And if you have three, is that we have very high, three dots, we have very high confidence. If you have one dot, is that we have moderate confidence on the attribution to the global warming. What you also see is that there are areas that are gray, the extreme south of South America and, and Central Africa. Those are areas where we cannot say what has happened recently because we do not have sufficient data. So there are still parts of the world that are not covered with weather stations or not um, uh, relevant, uh, not uh, trustable um, weather stations and thus we cannot say anything about what has happened recently. And even if we want to look at satellite data, satellite data go back in the, since the 1980s, but not, not far uh, before. And th there is another case here in, in, uh, in Central and East North America, <coughs> where you have a, a, a gray shading. And this means that in fact, there was no real observed changes, which may be a surprise and thus had pushed people to conclude that the recent global warming has no effect in those areas. And, in, and when you do your science and when you try to understand, in fact, it, it is the wrong conclusion. In reality, the global warming has led to increase in hot extremes in this region, but at the same time, people have made huge changes on the land and those changes on the land have dampened the hot extremes. And if you take the two anthropogenic actions, global warming on the one hand, deforestation and, and, and uh, agricultural development on the other hand, they compensate one another in this area on the hot extremes. Okay? So those, so, so, but you see that most of the planet is highly pink. So in most of the planets we have observed uh, a very high increase in hot extremes and we have attributed this increase in hot extreme to the increase in the global earth temperature. There are similar, uh, I, I put you uh, every time the, the, where, where those, uh, those maps come from, so you can go in on the site and you have similar uh, maps for rainfall events. And for rainfall events, what we do have is increase in the intensity of the highest rainfall events, yes. I was thinking so I just wanted to ask if you could explain a bit more that example of deforestation counteracting effects, just because the examples I know it's usually more the other way around. No, okay. Well, I, w I was going to to talk about this at the end, but we can we can very quickly. When you deforest, in fact, you tend to cool your surface, so you change the temperature, especially in mid and northern latitudes, uh, which is not the case in the tropics. In the tropics, if you do deforestation, you warm the tropics. In the medium to high latitudes, if you do deforestation, you cool your region because you, have, uh, um, you are reflecting back more energy because you make your uh, surface more bright. So you go from a dark surface to a bright surface, so you absorb less energy. And because you do not have, like in the tropics, transpiration of plants all year long, 
In fact, it's the energy part of the system that is strongly modified, and you keep more energy to your, uh, you, 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 um, you, you lose more energy from your ground, and, and, and then you have a cooler ground. So you have a cooling due to deforestation in those areas, and a warming due to, to the climate action, uh, uh, the, gr the global warming, and both compensate one another. They have different opposite effects on the extreme also. Okay? Um, so in terms of rainfall events, if we were to draw the same maps, you would see an increase in the high intensity rainfall events everywhere on land as well. So it's not that rainfall is increased, it's really the intensity of each rainy event that is increased. Does anyone have any idea of why we do have that? Why would we assume that we are just having the same total annual rainfall at a spot? We will have, any time it will rain, the, the, rainfall, the rain event will be more intense and thus we will have less rain events, okay? Because we need to have the same total annual. But the events are really more intense. And that's what we, we know, we, we live this. Okay, that's, that, that, that's the, the traditional answer that we get. No, but that, uh, you are right. I mean, part of your answer is right, is that in a warmer climate, we do have more evaporation, okay? But if you do not, if you cannot store more water vapor in your atmosphere, it's not going to change the intensity of the rainfall event. It's going to change the total annual rainfall, okay? So, your response is right, but it, it, it is not the one that explains why the rainfall events are more intense. Yes? The differences in temperature in the atmosphere increase, and because of this, the winds become more, um, like, uh, uh, there's more energy in the, in the atmosphere. And as a consequence, well, you have uh, winds that are stronger, and uh, it impacts um, cloud formation, I guess. And so this will uh, make Everything you said is right, but it's not the explanation. <laughs> uh, a third try? Yes? Could it be the presence of stronger hot extremes kind of initiating the process of cloud formation, the condensation? Okay, but then why is it that, okay, anytime the, the surface warms up, it, it increases convection, kind of but that way. does not obviously lead to more intense rainfall. So the response is that you, when you have a warmer atmosphere, you can store more water vapor in it. It's like if you were enlarging your reservoir, mm -hmm. okay? If you were deepening your soil, in a way, if, you, if the atmosphere was a soil, if you warm it, it's, it's the physical law of Clausius Clapeyron that if you increase your temperature, the temperature of the air, you can store in your air more water vapor before it condenses. And that is what happens. We are warming our air. Thus, we can store our reservoir in the atmosphere is increased and we can store more water vapor. So when this water vapor condenses, there is more water. And thus, the, uh, the precipitation event is more intense. It's just a pure physical law. Every, everything else you both said is true. But this is not the reason why uh, the rainfall event increases. Okay? Uh, yeah. I was just wondering, um, in context of monsoons, um, because I'm from a region yeah, where yeah. heavy rainfall, mm. and uh, back in 2020, we... Then his explanation is also true uh -huh. for the monsoon. Yeah. Back in 2020, we had very intense um, flooding happening. Um, so I'm more or less not, with my limited information and knowledge, I'm unable to uh, link what you have stated over there, more intense rainfall events, more drought. So, I mean, like, we're having rain, agricultural impacts, I'm unable to grasp that. Okay, so, so drought, uh, so, so we'll come back to drought. So let's keep on, on the rainfall events. For the monsoon, you have, you have a double phenomena. You have the phenomena I just explained, 
And there is the phenomena your, your, your colleague has explained, is in, in, a, in a way, because you wo the monsoon system uh, starts in, in spring when uh, the land becomes warmer than the ocean. And then it creates an advection, a, a wind, uh, that is driven by this thermal contrast between land and ocean, and that brings water vapor from the ocean to the land. When you have a climate change, as I showed earlier, the oceans are warm, warming um, uh, slow, uh, slower than, than the land. So in fact, you increase the thermal gradient between the, 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 the continents and, and, and the ocean, and your winds are stronger and because those winds carry water vapor and because evaporation increases, so we have this third explanation. So you see, we, we bring everything back together. So it's true for the monsoon. We also have more evaporation over the ocean. So those winds bring a saturated water vapor and at a faster pace. So it's more water vapor that can be stored on, on, uh, on the atmosphere. And then the rainfall, of the monsoon rain, rains are really more intense during the monsoon events but they can be more fragmented because if your atmosphere holds a lot of water, uh, of water vapor, then you need to wait before it saturates so that the rain uh, starts, uh, I mean, in, in very crude uh, way. So if, if your level of saturation is, is low, it will rain more often. If your level of saturation is high, it will rain less often, but the rain is going to be very intense. So you can have lots of pose in the monsoon, but with very intense rain. Then in terms of drought, drought, what causes drought, it's not so much for the moment changes in rainfall, but then we come back to the changes in evaporation. And yes, during uh, when the, the, the climate is warmer, the, the air deficit is bigger. And then the air is requiring most, more moisture from the land, from the ocean, etc. And because it's requiring mo more moisture, the plants do transpire more. So there is a, an increased loss of water from the soils and from the plants, even when there is no rain to compensate this loss. And that's why in many areas, we do have, or, yeah, there are areas that are losing water. We'll see this in terms of rainfall. We'll see this later. But in general, everywhere on the land, evapotranspiration increases. And thus, there is more loss of water from the soils and the plants. And that is the one key point for the ecological and agricultural drought. Um, so I w we were talking about the events in France. Uh, there was one, uh, one very uh, characteristic year. We had uh, several others since then, but the, the first uh, one that struck a lot the people was 2019 because we had a national exam uh, um, for kids that was stopped, cancelled, because it was too hot and the, the classes, the classrooms, are not really adapted for very high temperatures. And passing an exam when you exceed 35 degrees C, it, your brain is totally incapable of, think, of, of, of thinking. It's a time where we had the, the grapes that burned immediately uh, 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 on stage. I mean, you could not harvest at all. It was really an instantaneous burning of the, of the grapes. And we uh, passed many records in many places in France. And in fact, when you look at whether this heat wave could have happened in what we call a pre-industrial world, so without any warming during those more than almost 2000 years I showed you uh, before, no, a, all the calculations we made show that this heat wave was totally impossible we would never have experienced such a neat wave if we had not warmed our planet. With a 1.1 degree C of warming, a little uh, almost what, where we are now, then the probability is one out of 50 to have such a heat wave. If we reach the 1.5 degree C, which will be by 2030 at the latest uh, of global warming, the, the probability to get a, another of, this heat, of, of such a heat wave is one out of 10. And if we move to two degrees C, which probably we will 
meet by 2050, uh, then the, 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 the chance to get such a heat wave, well, or missed chance, <laughs> is one out of four. So just to answer your question about the two degree C, you see that for a heat wave that really broke a lot of records, agricultural uh, deficiencies, uh, problems of, um, of uh, sanitary, uh, problems of heat and, and death of a lot of people, problems during school, you go from, for one degree of warming, you go from a, a heat wave that goes from one out of five, 50 to one out of, out of four chances to, to happen. And that's enormous. So really for such an extreme event, that's really enormous. And then if we reach two degrees C, values close, we, we, we did a, a study for the city of Paris last year, uh, and the city of Paris came to us and said, well, uh, they were of course worried about the Olymp Olympics, and they were worried that we could reach 50 degrees C. And so they came to us and said, well, can we one day uh, go above 50 degrees C in Paris. So we went back, we analyzed uh, different trajectories of future climate change, and out of 1,000, we found 100 trajectories that, yes, show that we, we can exceed 50 degrees C in Paris. And if we go over a 2 degrees C global warming, the chances to get 50 degrees C in Paris are not zero. And they increase very fast uh, with global warming. And at three degrees C of warming, we may have almost one every other year, uh, uh, some days with, with uh, more than 50 degrees C in our city. So imagine in the buildings, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, so again, it is very important. A one degree C can really matter for those extremes, not for the mean climate, but really for those extremes. Yeah, you had a question? No? Okay. Uh, okay, what I want to say is that we've just been talking essentially about temperature and also a little bit of rainfall, but I prefer to ask about climate change rather than ab about climate warming, because the warming is one manifestation of climate change, but not the only one, okay? There are many more things than, um, than the change in temperature. So we talked about the water vapor in the atmosphere, we talked about rainfall, we talked about atmospheric circulation, okay? There are, in the ice compartment, you have probably uh, uh, followed that many glaciers have already disappeared on Earth. In Europe, in South America, uh, many glaciers have completely vanished. Some are really shrinking at, at a very fast rate today. That's also a manifestation, and that's a response to warming, but that's a manifestation of climate change. And even if warming were to stop, the glaciers would continue to melt because there is an inertia in the system and they have accumulated a, a, an excess of energy and this excess of energy makes them melt and will make them continue to melt even if the, the warming w were to stop. Um, in terms of what happens to the land, so we talked about precipitation. What happens to the natural vegetation is that there is a, an extension of the growing length, of the, of the um, growing length, the growing season length. So if you think of birds, and if you, you are a fan of uh, migratory birds, you, ca you can see that the, the timing of their coming and leaving has already changed. If you look at your uh, garden, you can see that the timing of when the first flowers come out and the leaf fall uh, goes, uh, the leaves start to fall has al also changed. So it's an earlier blooming and it's a later fall unless you have a sudden cold or uh, a drought. That's something different, but just in terms of temperature. We have what we call the global greenness is that we see uh, places in altitude where, they, where trees gr uh, start growing in altitudes where nobody has seen them before. It's because the altitude gets warmer and thus uh, allow the growth of certain types of tree. Same thing in the very high northern latitudes where we see the forest moving northward slowly. So because the energy in those regions increase for the trees and then they can survive. So that's what we call the greenness 
of our planet, so the planet is greener, uh, a longer growing season, new areas for trees to grow in altitude and at high latitudes. And there are many changes uh, also that we do see in the ocean. First, for the, for the fishes in the ocean, they, there, is a, there is a migration of the population of fish. Uh, there is the, ble the bleaching of corals that we do see. It's due to temperature and it's due to the CO2 that dissolves in the ocean. And for example, the ocean acidification that is due to the dissolution of CO2 and that makes the ocean more acid, which dissolves all the shelves. That's, that's an issue for the, the people who uh, grow uh, oysters, for example. Uh, the, 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 the acidity of the ocean starts to, to uh, destroy all shelves. So for oyster production or... Um, ah, les moules, comment on dit les moules? Muscle, merci. <laughs> Muscle production, etc. It's a real issue because then the, the shell is, is, uh, is, um, is getting thinner and thinner and, and that's, that's, a, that's a real problem. And, and this acidification has not been recorded in the ocean for at least two million years. So you see, you are seeing in every compartment of the climate system signals of this climate change. And uh, some of them have not been seen for uh, more than several thousands of years. And the last very important thing is the accumulation of heat uh, in, inside the ocean that is unprecedented for the last almost 20,000 years. So in fact, we are, um, we are storing more most of this energy that we are providing to the atmosphere, I'll come back to that, in the first thousands of meters of the ocean. And the, the ocean looks like a, 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 a heater, but with some delay. So again, if you stop the global warming, this, the ocean that has accumulated almost more than 90% of this excess of energy that we are putting to our atmosphere is going to give this energy back for hundreds and thousands of years. So there is a delay again. So the, the glaciers are still going to melt and the, the ocean is going to give back part of its energy. If I come back to the special heterogeneity of precipitation that I started to talk about uh, earlier, first I want you to look at this small graph that shows with a level of warming, so from 0 to 6 degrees C of global warming, the change in precipitation accumulated over the year and over the globe. So the more you warm, the more you have rainfall both because of evaporation and because of, of, uh, the, of the, the, the water vapor content of the atmosphere. At the global scale, the evaporation counts also. Uh, so, we, so you have this kind of almost linear relationship, but contrary to what happens with temperature, where in fact you warm every piece of the land everywhere on the globe, and every piece of the ocean, so it's a warming really everywhere. In rainfall, you have areas where you have more rainfall and areas where you have less rainfall. So any yellow and brownish color is a loss of rainfall, and any greenish and blue colors is a gain in rainfall. And what you see for Europe, for example, is that the Mediterranean area is losing more and more rain, and this is going to continue if we continue to warm the globe, it's, there is a, a concentration of the timing of precipitation, but there is also a concentration in the areas where rainfall uh, happens. And in the very high northern latitudes, on the contrary, it's a gain of rainfall. And we talked about the monsoon areas, so in India and also in Africa, where there will be more rainfall, but that's not obviously for a good, in a sense that it's going to, to too much rainfall during the, 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 the monsoon uh, rains may not be that good, especially if they are very intense, because it can provoke inundations, it can provoke erosions, and that's uh, very, uh, very uh, uh, problematic. 
We have also areas like the Amazon, who is going to lose, that is going to lose rainfall if we increase. That's why you may have heard some ecologists talking about the savanization of the Amazon rainforest. We do not know what's the tipping point, but of course it is a risk. Uh, there, are, there is a, a drying out of the entire Australia, which is part of the explanation of the mega fires that, uh, that have been experimented. And same thing for California, that is drying and losing rain with, uh, with the, the global warming. So you see a concentration, but also many areas where there is a loss of uh, precipitation. Yes. Could you explain the scale down there? So uh, it's a percent. It's a percent of. Um, yeah, sorry. It's a percent of change in rainfall, for w per degree of global climate change. So for one degree <coughs> of climate change in those dark blue areas, you'll have twelve percent additional rainfall. And in this, uh, this very uh, brown area, you will have 12% less rainfall. Okay, so it's the percent per degree of warming. Clear? Mm -hmm. And when I showed you the, the map before with the temperature, it was the local temperature change for one degree of global warming. Okay? Uh, okay, so what are the factors that influence climate? Now we'll come to how scientists do attribute this, uh, I, I mean, real climate scientists, not geologists, not uh, other people, do attribute uh, climate, climate change to human activities. Okay, we can come back to, to what geologists do to our community. But <laughs> um, <coughs> so the first, the first big, uh, big cause of climate change is the, 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 the orbit of our planet around the sun. That's what we call the paleoclimate theory that was uh, discovered by Milutin Milankovic, which was a Serbian mathematician in the 80s something. Um, and so the, the, our, our planet has a revolution around the sun, sun and the parameters of this, uh, of this uh, trajectory, plus the, the angle of the pole axis, that which is not straight, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it has an inclination are moving through time with very precise periodicity. And all those together make uh, uh, some, what we call the glacial interglacial cycle. So every 100,000 years, the Earth changes, uh, has, has a, a revolution of climate. So we go from interglacial, so warm time period, then it takes something like 60,000 years to get into an ice age. Then you have your ice age and you get 20,000 years to get out of your ice age. And then you do this, you repeat this every 100,000 years. Okay, so that's a very nice periodicity that we can see. Uh, I don't have this here, but you can see this in the ice core measurements where you record the uh, atmospheric CO2 content. And you see this, those cycles. The other things that can make our climate change is what we call the natural climate variability. Those are the El Nino, La Nina that you may have heard about, okay? So those are purely natural phenomena that exists, if that existed before human, uh, uh, the human come to, to, to on the planet and will probably continue to exist after we are gone. And it's, uh, it's, um, it's because you have uh, two, uh, fl two fluids the ocean and the atmosphere that interact together with different characteristics, physical characteristics, and this created uh, a, a kind of chaos, not really chaos, but it's, it's organized. Uh, and, and that's the natural variability that our models are able to, uh, to compute, to reproduce. Then there is the volcanic activity. There is the solar activity, so volcano. What happens when there, when there is a volcano? Is it going to cool or to warm the globe? Exactly, exactly, so it's a cooling. Solar activity on the reverse, it's a warming. And we have all the anthropogenic factors, 
So all our emissions, our land use, etc., that is also a, that can also be a cause of climate change. So what we do is that we build climate models. So a climate model is a is a model where we put in mathematics, we translate in mathematical equations our knowledge of how the ocean functions, the atmosphere functions, the land functions, the ice functions, and how they interact together. And then we put this in supercomputers and we do our calculations. So a climate model is a little bit like a weather forecast model, but it's more complex because a weather forecast model does not have an interactive ocean, does not have an interactive ice sheet. So it's less complex because it, the weather forecast model looks only at a few days ahead, while we look at uh, several thousand years before and several hundred years in the future. Okay. And then once we have our model, we can play with it. And when we play with it here is that we try to reproduce the observed changes in the global temperature. So the observation is the black line. So we go from 1850 to almost today. And we want to see what causes this increase in temperature at the, at, at, uh, at the surface of our planet. So we first try only the natural causes, solar eruption, uh, volcanic eruption, because in the past we have observed them. In the future, it's hard to predict the volcanic eruptions. It's not so hard to predict the solar eruption, but the, the volcanic ones, is, it's quite hard. And, and, and all the natural variability uh, that, that our model can create. And you see that if we just take into account the natural causes, we stay around the zero line, so nothing happens. So if natural causes were the sole players of the last 150 years, we would not have a global warming. Then we put into our models the three greenhouse gases, the increase in three greenhouse gases that I showed you in one of the first slides, CO2, CH4, and 2O. And we just put this, we just fed our model, climate models with the, those information. And here we get the pink uh, a shading play, a place where you see that the warming of our planet would have been bigger than what we experienced just with the greenhouse gases. And then for the blue one, we put only all other pollutants, every aerosol that we are sending to our atmosphere. And as an aerosol, it's like the ash. It's blocking the solar radiation. So it's, it's a cooling effect. And the gray one is when we put everything together, natural causes, aerosols, greenhouse gases, and then our gray shading here really matches the observed uh, evolution of temperature. And that is using those kind of tools that we conclude that there is no doubt human activities have caused the recent climate warming. Okay, so it's really playing with the most advanced tools and doing what we call some sensitivity studies. So applying one force, testing different uh, ways to, to force our climate and try to understand. Now, of course, paleoclimates have changed a lot. And today, we are supposed to have started the next glaciation since 6,000 years ago. So the orbit of our planet is such that we, sh we should have started the next glaciation. So we should see a slight decrease of temperature, so a slight cooling. And when we try with the CO2 that we have in the atmosphere today, we try to see whether we will still enter the natural pace of climate change, no we will never enter the last glaciation. Is it a good news? Is it a bad news? I don't know. None of us will be here to see it in any case, because it will be in 60,000 years, so it's very far away. But that's what, why s many scientists have proposed to name our era Anthropocene. It's because human activities are such that they, had the, they have the power 
to change the natural pl pl pace of climate variations, uh, uh, which is this 100,000 year cycle between glacial and interglacial stages. And that's why we believe that Anthropocene is, even though geologists rejected this, uh, this solution, uh, another, another punching ball <laughs> with them between climate scientists and, and geologists, but they have rejected this uh, definition, but still it's important to, to think about this and to think that yes, we have changed the natural pace of our climate change, of our climate. And, and, uh, and thus it's, it's meaningful, okay? So, why, yes? Just one clarification question. You said that we will never enter the next glacial age. Yes. Because it's already the overflow. Yes, it's too, we have too much, in fact, we have too much CO2 in the atmosphere yet. We are almost at 420 parts per million. And this is too much to counter because when we have these glacial interglacial stages, it's, uh, it's very small changes of insulation. So of what it's something like five to six watt per square meter difference. And with our 420 uh, parts per million, we are already at plus three watt per square meter additional in our atmosphere rather than, um, than uh, less. And, and so we are already starting and CO2 is, remains very long in the atmosphere. So it, it will take very long before we get rid of this CO2 and we can start again uh, uh, a natural uh, cycle. So the, only the, the next cycle will happen normally? It's like the other depending on how much more we put of CO2 in the atmosphere <laughs> and depending on whether uh, all the very high northern latitudes reject the amount of CO2 they have in the soil that is frozen today. So we don't know. We don't know. We have not, I mean, I don't think there is any paper that has started to think about the, the, uh, the next one. Not, not the next next, but the next next. <laughs> I don't know. So why does this happen? In fact, if you, if you think of those 2,000 years that are almost uh, in equilibrium, even if it's very tiny, tiny, tiny uh, uh, cooling, in a, in, a, in a stable climate, in fact, you, the, the engine of our climate, uh, of the movement of our ocean atmosphere and of the, the, the pace of, uh, of the living is the solar energy we get and how it's di distributed by, uh, by latitude, okay? So in an equilibrium and a stable climate, you, you get energy from the sun, the planet warms, and then it gives the energy back to, the, to space and it's back in the form of thermal energy so it's, uh, it's uh, what we call infrared uh, energy. It's when, when you are in the dark and when you have infrared lenses, then you see the people because we are warmer than the air outside and then we radiate thermal energy in the, in the, in the infrared radiation. That's a stable climate, but what we do is that we do put greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And the particularity of greenhouse gases is that they capture this infrared energy, this thermal energy that the Earth is radiating back to space. It, it blocks it and it sends it back to the soil. So in fact, you prevent some energy to escape our planet. So it's an imbalance. You have more energy coming in than energy coming out. And in the physical system, you, I mean, the physics dislikes this kind of imbalance. So the, war, the planet is warming to increase its radiant energy in the form of thermal energy and thus to equilibrate the incoming solar energy. And that's what happened, it's pure physical laws. So it's just a response to this surplus of energy. And so the, the planet warms up to give more energy back and to come back to a, a, a balanced uh, equation, okay? So with this additional energy that that the, the greenhouse gas is sending back to the planet. As I told you earlier, 90% of it is stored in the <coughs> first uh, thousands of meters of the ocean. And what we feel is only the remaining 10% that made our atmosphere warm by 1.2 degrees. But because we have this energy, 
it's, it's a delay. It's just a delay in the system. The, the ocean is at one point going to give back the energy. It's like at your home, if you have a, a heater, uh, which is not a convector, but a condensation heater, then you can, you can unplug it. If it's warm and it has kind of oil or something in it, it will give you the, the, the heat back for many hours. That's exactly the same for the ocean. It's storing energy and then it will give it back at one point. So that's really the why we why we do, we do experience this warming. Yeah. Um, what's the typical? Can you say because it's ten percent, then it's one and a half degrees. Let's Something say, like that. Yeah. And then the the ninety percent does it translate equally to the warming? Or no, no, not like not no. It's more complex than yeah, that yeah, okay. because it can go at very deep deep layers in the ocean. It's going to change the CO two, the dissolution. It's going. Oh, okay. You have many feedbacks also on the biogeochemical cycle, so it's going to also change those fluxes. So it's, no, it's not that simple. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's what, why we, we, we talk also about climate urgency. So I've showed you many things. Uh, I've showed you many impacts. The, and some of those impacts are already irreversible. N not, of course, at the pace of geology, our planet may have new glaciers again, but not at the timing of our societies because it takes a long time to build uh, glaciers. So the melting of glaciers, the melting of permafrost that has started, the sea level rise that causes the loss of land, causes the loss of islands. I don't know if you have followed the uh, last year, I think. Yeah, I think it was in 2023 or early 2024. Australia announced that they were getting ready to welcome people from islands within the next 20 years because those islands are going to be completely underwater in the next 20 to 30 years. And there is, uh, I don't know, 20,000 people living there. And Australia has started to, to, to organize itself to welcome those people. And they want to do a gradual welcoming in order to slowly uh, integrate them in their society. Uh, that, that's. Uh, an enormous, incredible uh, manifestation of climate change. We have a rapid increase of exposed populations. So we have already many regions that, e that are experiencing uh, days uh, that go beyond our human limits. So when you, you need to, to stay at home or you need to put on your air conditioning or you need to, to be in the shelter because otherwise you are suffering, so you have, especially in the equatorial regions, you have more and more of those days. And it's, and it's becoming a real issue because if the climate continues to warm, many regions may become inhabitable. Okay? Uh, and then the extremes are more frequent, more extremes. And also we start having some combination. For example, in France, uh, it was... In the ancient time, it was very rare to have at the same time a heat wave and a drought. And now, over the past 20 years, you, we almost always have at the same time drought and heat wave. Okay, so you have combinations that did not exist also in the past. So when we want to project ourselves in, in the future, uh, we have to follow two steps. In fact, in fact, climate scientists are not the first one to work. The first one to work are demographers, sociologists, economists, people who are planning, uh, who are um, trying to draw uh, evolution of the societies. How many will we be on, on the planet in the future? What will be our living conditions? What will be our habits? Are we all going to turn vegan? Are we all going to eat more and more meat? What is it that we are going, what type of energy are going to, to appear and are going to be used? So you have a, 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 an enormous amount of work with, where you have scientists trying to imagine the societies of tomorrow. And they are drawing um, uh, narratives of those societies. And behind those narratives, we climate scientists need numbers. So we need numbers about how many, how, how many greenhouse gases, how these greenhouse gases emissions are going to change, what are the pollutants we are going to have in the future, by how much, 
uh, how land is going to change. Are we going to cut all our forest? Are we going to grow more forest? We need all these informations to feed our climate models. Our climate models, they are just calculating the interactions and the dynamics, but they do not compute the behavior of the society. They do not compute uh, the, the way uh, people are going to use the land. Okay, so we need, to, we need to have information on that. So once those societies have been imagined for the future, we, and, the, the, and the, they have derived changes in emissions and uh, land occupation, then we climate scientists come with our tools and we look at the climate future. So when we start, for example, this is changes in emissions from fossil fuels. So the black is what has been done already. And uh, well, it's, it's an old report because that 2014 was an estimate at that time. Um, and, uh, and up to 2100. 20, so you see all those, each line is a narrative of the future. So we have thousands of narratives that do exist. But our climate models cannot do thousands of simulations. It's even with the, the, the fastest computer, the more uh, developed computers that we do have now, we are not yet able to do as many tests as uh, the, the, the ones who were before us can do. So we just select samples of them. So we select extreme ones, we select some, some that are consistent. Yes? Ah. The, the, the net negative is that you increase the land and ocean sink. So you increase the capacity of your land to do photosynthesis. You increase the capacity of the ocean to absorb CO2. Okay. That's how you, you, today that's how you do if you avoid geoengineering. Okay, that's another, that's another issue. Uh, and, and what we do also is that we, we we, we need to gain confidence in our models, so we go back and we look at what has happened in the past, what we had projected before it happened, and whether we were right or not. And so in those, again, that's an old figure, but it doesn't change. So we, um, 2000 was the year where we really uh, reproduced what has happened, and uh, we started all our projections uh, in 2000. So uh, at the year 2000s, of course, we did not know what would happen. So the, the black line was our projections with our climate models, and the red and blue lines are observations of what really, hap of what really happened. So in fact, we were not wrong. So everything we predicted really occurred, of course, not in detail in every region, but at the global scale. So we gained confidence in our, uh, in our projections. And so what we learned also from everything we did is that there is a, a quasi-linearity quasi between our emissions and the temperature of the increase in temperature of, the, of our planet. So in this horizontal axis, you have the, the cumulative emissions since 1850. So it's not the instantaneous uh, emissions, really, if you add up all yearly emissions since 1850, we have already reached all something like 24 gigatons of CO2 emitted. And that gives you our 1.1, 1.2 degrees C of warming. And because there is this quasi-linearity, that's how we can extrapolate, because we know what are the emissions per year. So, and every year we increase our emissions. We have never stopped our emissions, ex except during the COVID, where we slowed down a little bit our emissions and then we came back. So every year we are adding a little bit more of emissions. So as long as we add CO2 in the atmosphere, we add warming. I was wondering, like, what I, from what I followed, there's now this debate going on on whether the, the rapidness of climate change is accelerating is that consistent with this figure? Well, what is not true is that the climate change is accelerating. But if a climate change was accelerating, this figure will be obsolete. But for the moment, we've, uh, it's, uh, 
in th that's um, what I would say. That's the, the that's a, a wrong interpretation of a paper that showed that we can classify climate models by looking at what has happened really on the ground and we can discard some climate models uh, from, the, from our observations. And what we see is that the projections seem to be cooler than what's really happening. So we can now select the best models and go, and the best models are the warmest ones. But for the moment, we do not see any, so that's from the modeling community. But in terms of observations, we do not see yet any acceleration, at least nothing that we can statistically confirm. Maybe in 20 years, we would say, no, yeah, it has already, it had started to accelerate, but we don't have sufficient information and sufficient confidence to, to provide such a, such a conclusion. study on the different rates of acceleration in, say, the global north and then the global south. Because something you mentioned that, imagine 50 degrees here in Paris is crazy, but come from India. Yes. And we reached 50 yeah. degrees. Yeah, you're already over above that, yeah. Yeah, so, so do you think that bringing that perspective would, would show us different results or, or give us a better understanding of? I, I'm not sure I, I understood your question. Why would it be, you, you want to say, like the rate of acceleration in the climate change, for example, right? Well, uh, you, they, they are two different things. The rate of the acceleration of the climate change sh uh, must be looked at at the global scale, mm -hmm. okay? But then in individual regions, mm -hmm. of course, it can be faster in some regions than in others. Just an example, in France. In France, up to um, 1950, although climate change had already warmed, and even in Europe, in Western Europe, we, it was almost no visi not visible on the weather stations. And this was because at that time, the level of pollution in Western Europe was very high. Okay, and then in the 70s or 80s, there was this uh, Montreal pr Protocol that put a very stringent conditions on, on the certain types of pollutants. And then Western Europe started to be uh, depolluted and after the 1980s and 1990s, suddenly we saw the warming, but we saw all of the warming at once. Because we removed this pollution in the atmosphere, which was aerosols, and which was really blocking part of the solar energy. And then we could say, yes, it's coming very fast. But in fact, it was just masked by another effect. So you are right in saying by per region, we need to do some analysis per region but at the glo we can only talk about acceleration of the climate change at the global scale. And at the global scale, there is no obvious, there is no evidence that this is happening. But at the regional scale, you are right. There are some regions where we see an acceleration. But it can be because there were, either because uh, something on the land management has changed and it makes things worse, or because there is a kind of depollution or repollution that changes uh, the energy and, and something that has not been seen and suddenly pops up. So I don't know whether it answers your questions or not. We can, we can discuss later if you wish. Um, I'm almost done. Yeah, ah, pardon. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting because we have, a, we have a hot debate in our scientific community, not in terms, of, um, in terms of language, essentially. If you look at this, yes, it is still possible, geophysically speaking. If we were to stop all our emissions today, the climate will stabilize. But then are we able to stop all our emissions today? Okay. So if you look at the COVID, which was really the planetary scale uh, situation and simulation, uh, not a simulation, a reali something realistic, 
we just had a small drop of our emissions. So we dropped, by, I think we reduced by uh, three to five percent at the global scale, I think, something like that. But then we came up again once uh, we started. And although good habits have, had been taken by many people, uh, still we have, we have this. Uh, so, 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 so the debate for us is, do cl are climate scientists allowed to continue saying that theoretically this is possible? While we all know that society is not going to stop instantaneously. So it is not possible. And, and there is a debate in, 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 in the language that scientists should uh, ado adopt. Uh, do we have to speak the truth in that? But, but the, the truth is not the one of the climate scientists. The climate scientist is a physicist, essentially. Uh, uh, and, uh, and yeah, from the physical point of view, it is still possible. But in reality, uh, but that, that's a hot, a very hot debate, in fact, huh, in the, in the so I think it's a almost ridiculous debate, but, um, but it's, in, it's interesting. This is uh, showing you um, the different paths we need to take and the path we are taking. So if we want to, so, so what we are looking at is the, the, the emissions of CO2 uh, per year up to 2050. And if we want to uh, limit the, the warming to 1.5, we should have already started to <coughs> decrease our yearly emissions with a very, very stringent pace. If we want to limit it to 2 degrees, we still need to start now, but the pace is a little bit less steep. The slope is a little bit less steep. The dark purple here is the intentions of the government, the nationally determined intentions during the COP uh, period, each country comes saying, this is what I can do. And this is what I can do. We scientists translate this into emissions and then we translate this into temperature. So you see that if we put all together the nationally determined contributions, even though the the, the, the timing is not completely the same. Yes, it does limit the warming to 1.5 or 2. So the countries together have said that they can do it. And the, the red one is if we based our uh, calculations on what has already started in each individual country. What we really hold now, what has started, what is in the lows, what the people have started to do. And what you see is that it means that we, we will still continue to increase and we will stabilize at one point the total emissions of CO2, but we will continue to increase and thus we will reach, the assumption is that by 2100 we will reach about 3 degrees C of global warming. But that's already much better than what we had in 30 years from now before, where we, would, we were predicting 5 degrees C of warming. So all countries have really started to work on, on their emissions. Everyone on the globe has started to work on their emissions. And we, we have ex escaped the worst of the worst, but still it's, it's a 3 degrees C target by 2100 so far. Okay? Uh, so just to leave more time for the discussion, uh, just to, to tell you that every further ton of CO2 emitted will contribute to aggravate, increase the regional patterns of climate change. So warming on the top, warmer and warmer regions and the drought, the regions that will experience um, less rainfall, the rainfall decrease is going to be more intense if the warming gets bigger. Every extreme is going to be more frequent and more intense. Uh, just for you to, to look for France, for example, uh, within those, so, so that th th those bubbles represent in yellow the, the heat waves that we have already experienced. So here it's the duration of the heat wave uh, in the horizontal axis, the um, intensity, the, the maximum temperature uh, that we can reach and the, the, the size of the bubble is the intensity of the heat wave. And 
if we go on the highest warming level, these are all the heat waves that we can expect in France that we have never met so far. That will be completely new. And we can do this for uh, many, many other places and many other countries. So we are in a world, we are entering a world that we do not know. Okay. Uh, so we talked about the land quickly for the deforestation. Uh, today we are using about 70% of our land, the non-glaciated land. Okay, 1% our cities and infrastructure. It's just 1%. We are 50% of humanity living on 1% of the land. All the rest is our exploitation for wood, for, uh, for um, uh, animals, uh, and, and for uh, uh, croplands. Okay, that's, so this is our usage of the land. And one fourth, uh, it's only one fourth that is, not, that is free of direct human influence, of course, indirect via, via the atmosphere. So they are feeling the global warming, but they have no direct influence. So that is a lot. And it's a lot if you think of the land-atmosphere interaction. So the, the land is exchanging at every instant some water vapor, some heat, some uh, greenhouse gases, uh, some uh, what we call uh, some particles like dust, uh, biogeo um, biogenic organic compounds that make particles in the atmosphere. So the land has the power to change at every moment the state of the atmosphere, its, uh, its thermal state, its hydric state, and its pollution. And because of that, what happens where we live can and how we, we manage our land can affect the weather where we are or can modulate some, some, uh, some uh, effects. So at the global scale, the land contributes to global warming. Our activities, to contribute, our activities on the land contribute to global warming through agriculture, uh, through our cut of the wood, through deforestation, through our breeding of animals, uh, through rice cultivation, etc., and we are emitting uh, by our land activities 23% of all greenhouse gases uh, that provoke climate change. 23% come from our usage of the land. Okay, the biggest part, of course, is due to transport, energy, etc. So 13% 13, 13 of CO2, 44% of the CH4 emissions, and 82% of uh, the N2O. But the land as a whole, not just the agricultural activity, is also pumping some CO2 from the atmosphere, just the CO2, from the atmosphere, and it's absorbing 29% of what we emit. So it means that any time we emit 100 molecules of CO2, 29 are taken back by the land for photosynthesis to increase its growing season, etc. Okay? So the land is already helping us by preventing an excess of CO2 in the atmosphere. And if the ocean also is playing its part. So the land is taking in 29, the ocean is taking about 25 per, uh, percent of what we emit. And as a whole, uh, land and oceans today represent a net sink of about 54%. So anytime we emit 100 molecules of CO2, 54 are taken back either by the ocean or by the land. That's we what we call the land, the biospheric sink. The worry that we have is that the more we warm, so that going from left to right, the more we warm our planet, the more we take a risk that this sink decreases because of the ocean acidification that will limit its capacity to absorb CO2. And because there is more drought on the land that will increase fire, that will make plants desiccate. So if they do not function, they will not absorb CO2. Because in the very high northern latitudes, we have frozen soil, rich of carbon. If it defreezes, it will release its carbon. There are many reasons for the CO2 
to remain in vaster quantities in the atmosphere. So you see that our simulations show that we can continue to increase the sink, so go from 50 to 70 percent, by slightly warming because, in fact, vegetation likes CO2. So the more it's, it's not the CO2 in the atmosphere that will limit vegetation on, on land, it, because the more CO2 you have, the more plants are happy because they have means to, uh, to create their own biomass. But then it's temperature, rainfall, and it's all the rest that may limit their capacity to absorb this CO2. But the more we warm, you see that we can strongly decrease the amount of CO2 that is uptaken by the land or the ocean. And if we do decrease, instead of uptaking 54, we uptake 38, that means that there is more CO2 that remains in the atmosphere, and that will accelerate global warming. That will be an acceleration at that point of global warming. Okay, so there is a there is also a, a risk of escaping some some functioning uh, of of the biosphere, and and we don't. That's a, that's an estimate. We, in fact, we don't know how the living is going to react to to very high temperature. We we do not have or almost have no observations of temperate regions with very high temperatures. So we don't know how temperate ecosystems, for example, will react to temperatures that ecologists have not recorded in these areas and do not find. So we don't, don't know where we are going. Um, and locally, the land is mitigating, can mitigate climate change. If you put uh, a forest or a very uh, an ecosystem that has a lot of water, that transpires a lot of water, in an area where you have a heat wave, it will dampen your heat wave. If at the, uh, on the contrary you have a heat wave coming on a sandy area, then it will exacerbate heat and the feeling, your feeling will be much bigger. Okay, so how you use the land is going to affect the, the, um, the way you are going to feel climate change. Okay, so I'm, I'm done. So what, what I want to just you to, to remember is that our actions have broken the regularity of glacial interglacial cycles. That's what we call the Anthropocene, even if this word is not accepted uh, officially in the scientific community, it's still used quite, quite a lot. The recent climate evolution or is not homogeneous, nor in time, nor in space but it is without any doubt resulting from human activities. And there is absolutely no doubt to, uh, to, to this. There is uh, uh, no way this can be discarded, so uh, it's, uh, it has to be said again. The climate models that we are using, even though um, it's climate science is a very, climate science using models is a very uh, recent discipline. It has started in the 1970s. So compared to other scientific disciplines, uh, it's quite new, okay? But still we have, uh, they have been, those models have been quite good at reproducing the past, the past trends. And there is a gr an, an agreement on some upcoming risks like the global warming is relatively proportional to our cumulative emissions of CO2. So more CO2, more warming. Many regions of the world will become an, uninhabitable and essentially around the equators and the tropics, not so far uh, at our latitudes or further north. Land contributes to the evolution of climate globally because it's source and sinks of CO2. That's why we talk about global greening, global reforestation and afforestation. It's really to pump more CO2, more and more CO2 back and to play a role in the global climate. So that means that it's a role on climate mitigation, but at our living scale at our local and regional scale, vegetation can modulate the redistribution of water and energy. I have not spent a lot of time on that, but that's the heart of my work. Uh, and, and thus it can help uh, mitigate the manifestation of climate change regionally. So it's two different players, ways to play a role in the climate system. And the, the worry of course is that if the climate system gets too warm, the sink capacity of land ecosystems will decrease. And I will leave you with this uh, figure 
just to remind you that a climate risk, it's not just a matter of climate. Okay, if with the climate system, rainfall events, the intensity of rainfall events increase, it means that if your land is really vegetated with trees, grasses, etc., with a porous soil where the water can infiltrate, you may not get any flooding. But if you are on an impervious surface, a city or whatever, you have made your soil impervious, then you will get a flooding. So you can mitigate the potential impacts of ra intense rainfall events by really having a land that can absorb this excess of water. So you have the hazard, that's the climate, but then you have whether you are exposed or not, whether you are vulnerable or not, or your soil is more or less pervious, and whether you can respond and you can really play a game. And that's just a, a simple way to look at it. You've got two workers, you've got a hazard, okay? One is, one is really vulnerable, more vulnerable than the other. It's exposed because it's right below. It's vulnerable because it has removed his, his helmet. So the, the response is how far away are the emergency services? Thank you. Questions? Yes. Yes. We take two or three. Hello, um, my name is Matilda. I'm from Germany. Uh, I just wanted to ask, you briefly talked about some que big questions in the climate modeling community. So should you t say it's possible to reach 1.5? I just wanted to ask if you sh could briefly share some other insights, what main debates are and what maybe some trends are or developments in climate modeling. Uh, you want to, I'm not sure what you are asking. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, no. maybe just uh, within each discipline, there are some big debates that are going on and some general ah, trends. I mean other than this 1.5. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I would not talk about debate. We are just think in, in our climate community, I would say there are maybe two branches. One branch is, um, is uh, the, the want people who want to really make more efforts to improve our global climate models. And others, to which I tend to more belong, where you want to uh, increase uh, the, the, the capacity that we have to make the climate um, projections more territorial, more regional. Because we have a long way yet to provide scenarios that are trustable at the scale of our countries of, or far, our, of our territories. It's easier to do some global climate simulations because it's, it's an, a big average, then to really know exactly what will happen uh, regionally. And, and we, we have a lot of uh, uncertainties at the regional scale yet. And I think we should put a little bit more effort on that. So, so that's the, the two branches of the climate science development. Then we have, of course, a lot of the, the other third branch of the climate development is uh, now to also spend more time in the translation of our knowledge of climate evolution into understandable, um, uh, discor not discourse, understandable uh, also indicators that are useful for the socioeconomic world to move forward and to adapt. And there is a kind of cutoff between the climate community and the actors in the socioeconomic world and the actors take the, the projections of climate change that we make available, but they ha there is a huge misuse of our scenarios. And so uh, a number of us uh, have taken the, the decision now to work more and more at the interface with uh, the agri agricultural world, with other, the industrial world, etc., to try really to make a good use of this climate projection so that you move faster in the adaptation. And that's also, we, we need to, this is where we need also uh, socioeconomists and we need a lot of people to work with us. It's very an interdisciplinary in order to understand where we go. So there is no real debate, I would say, uh, today. Uh, there is more uh, where we put our, the, the, the discussion between us is where we should put the greatest effort. And it's good that we, that we split at least in, in all those avenues in any case. 
but it's it's not a debate. Um, hi, I'm Arthur from the Netherlands. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the interesting talk. And uh, what I was wondering is like in the news and in the papers, I always read about all these tipping points, like the permafrost thawing that you talked about, but also uh, the stopping of the thermo highline movement. And I never really grasped like to what extent those tipping points have been studied and to what extent are they included already in these IPCC reports or could mm. reality be even worse than the reports if these tip tipping points are true? So. Okay, so no, that's, that's a very good question. So they are included, yes, they, uh, they are not a lot of studies, but they are included in the IPCC report. That's what we call, uh, what's the word? Um, it's uh, uh, scenarios with little chance but huge impact. That's not the exact phrasing. I can't remember how it's written in the in the report. But there, there is a, a, a I, I don't know whether it's a chapter or a, where we look specifically at those uh, scenarios that have little chance that we think have little chance to occur. But if they do occur, they have huge impacts and we still need to examine th those. But yes, there are uh, a lot of uh, studies, uh, there are some studies on those. Um. And they are included, but I can't remember in which chapter. I can have a look and, and, and send you the information. Hi, uh, my name is Nikhil Rampal, I'm from India. So in the last five years, uh, in my home state of Punjab, which is the bread and rice capital of India, We've had three climate tragedies in three harvest seasons. Uh, and I, I visited thrice uh, because I was a journalist at that time. So once the heat wave was so strong mm -hmm. for a few days that the grain, which uh, the wheat grain actually shrank mm -hmm. and the farmers were unable to sell it because you cannot make wheat out of it. Mm -hmm. So the problem that we, um, both from academic and journalistic point of view, that climate science or the language of climate science is not channeled into, say, for example, a loss of how much output uh, of agriculture produced would be or how much food are we going to miss if we are going to increase temperatures say one or two degrees. Because, for example, the so-called climate economists like Richard Toll, uh, especially the climate deniers, their arguments are uh, that 100 years of growth, 100 years of GDP growth is valued more than a two degree centigrade climate change. Like an increase of two degrees centigrade is less than the 100 years of GDP growth. So, but when we look at on ground that food agricultural production is going to suffer a lot, how do climate change or how can the climate change uh, scientists convince general masses to not believe such economists? Yeah, th I think that's, that's, that's a very good question. For me, it's, uh, it's all the things that we want to develop through the climate services. Um, we, as climate scientists, will not answer the question of uh, what will be the loss. But working with people that can translate uh, certain indicators of climate or weather, let's say, into uh, changes in yield, then what we can produce, once we know what is the variables we need to look at, we can produce information, statistical information on how often, like the heat wave, is it going to be every other year, every five years, uh, every 50 years? Uh, and we can try to understand that if we work closely together and that gives information for <coughs> the decision makers. So that's the entire world of climate services that we have started to, uh, in France, uh, about 10 to 15 years ago, but we are way, way, way from being very uh, good at, at, uh, at doing it correctly. So that's exactly what, and that's exactly what we are trying to, we have started to do now. And, uh, and I hope we are going to be quite fast, but I cannot say, I mean, because it's, uh, the difficulty is that, um, is the climate scientists that stop doing their pure climate work and that go into this direction. It's not people who just start in this direction. It will come. But there are few jobs for, for the moment. For There's no job for the moment for climate services. We do not have extra funding. So we have to divert climate scientists from one type of work to another one. 
it's reallocation of resources in a way. And, uh, and that's difficult because uh, uh, the way scientists are evaluated today, uh, also it's sometimes hard to publish correctly in this kind of, of uh, world, uh, which is quite new, especially if we work in very transdisciplinary. For us, it's complicated. So it's, there are lots of, uh, lots of blocking steps for, for, for a fast uh, move onward, but, uh, but we are quite a lot to really take this seriously. And we have recently got some funding, so I hope I'm going, we are going to move uh, very quickly on that. Um, hello, uh, I'm Zulfia from Azerbaijan. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for the presentation. It was really interesting for me. But um, I think uh, that you kind of started uh, touching the question I was about to ask, because I wanted to ask uh, what is the political participation of uh, climate scientists? like? Because like um, sometimes it feels like um, scientists is very far from like decision making processes and like uh, and like decision makers are different people who are not fully aware what is happening. So I wanted to ask if there are any movements or like if there are any kind of initiatives or like how much like uh, political participation is like uh, present presence is there and what what do you see as a solution of it if it's not there and how it can be raised and in which ways what do you think about that yeah that's a very good question <coughs> so i don't know about what is done in other countries but in france we have started to to build regional expert group on climate change and ecological transition so i built one here for ile de france in 2021 uh, now almost all regions of France start having one and that's what we do is that we interact with uh, with the political uh, decision makers we try to to work on the um, uh, on the strategic uh, documents yes, yes, <coughs> planification plan. mm. to try to inject the most science as we can but I can tell you it's very hard first I have no knowledge about those how police policy is made so I'm learning, but I, I have nothing to lose now. I'm at the end of my career, so I go and I try to do something. Um, it's very hard, in fact. It's very hard because we also, as scientists, learn that for them to take a decision, it's they have to compose with a lot of things and not just science. So we are here saying science is first, etc. But that's not true, in fact. Science is not always first. So we are trying to, what we are trying to do in, in the group uh, uh, that, that I created is really to, um, to formulate what we think is the most important, so the skeleton of what needs really to be in it. Uh, the substantific, uh, substantific moi, I don't know how to translate <laughs> this, but really to have this, this in, in the documents and, and so that then it can percolate into every action. And we also try to accompany it, but it's, it's a very, it's very hard because at the same time, we, there is an urgency, you are right, but, but those kind of things take time. And in fact, the real, your com you, you as, uh, as the youth, you have, you have known this for the past maybe five years, but you are not, all the people of your age are not yet convinced also. Uh, so, so, so it takes time. And, and in fact, we alerted 30 years ago and 30 years later, you have a lot of people that are convinced and you have many things that have started. So I would tend to look at the, the glass that is half full rather than half empty, in fact. Because I think we really escaped the plus five degrees here of warming. We have escaped that. It's not going to happen because things have happened in the good direction. And it's going to continue unless there is something uh, that's... I, ha has seen, but, uh, I, don't know. <laughs> I have a question myself, yes. uh, because you do not mention in your speech uh, one thing that for me was one of the most shocking when I discussed with some scientists and one, a friend of mine has obtained that in the summary report for the policymakers, IPCC 2023, page 16, there is a chart, <laughs> there is a chart on humid heat. Yes. And humid heat uh, mm -hmm. is, uh, in particular for India and for yes. all South Asia, will probably make all those regions unhabitable yes. yeah, yeah, for, that's, that's not for one are, day, not for two days, yeah, yeah. but for 100 it's days a year. Yeah, 
and it's completely crazy. I yeah. mean, third, I, mean I, I don't know if you know, but 35 degrees with 100 uh, percent of humidity means you cannot live more exactly. than a few hours. Yeah, yeah. And, and it will be the case in those regions yeah. for hundreds of days yeah. a year. Yeah. So yeah. maybe yeah. you can tell a few words about that and, and then... Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, when I, when I uh, on, on one slide, because I couldn't go, go through uh, uh, every impact, but when I say that some areas in the equatorial and tropical regions may become un uninhabitable, it's because of this. It's because of this combination of increase in the air humidity and increase in temperature that make things, uh, the, the suffering of human much bigger. And yes, exactly, there are some regions that are going to have more than six, if we reach three degrees C of warming, a lot of regions in the equatorial uh, area will have more than three months per year above uh, uh, suffering levels or even uh, lethal levels. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's very impressive. Uh, it's so one of the slides that I removed. <laughs> Uh, my name is Felice, I'm from Brazil. You talked about the power of uh, land and ocean to act as a sink. Mm -hmm. And I would like to understand if there is studies or initi initiativities uh, regarding uh, amplifying the power of ocean to act as a sink, if it makes sense, and how could that work? Uh, are there solutions, uh, geoengineering solution? Yes, you put some more iron in the, in the sea and uh, you capture more CO2. Do they make sense? No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yes, there are solutions, but they do not, at least for the biological uh, living uh, in the living bodies in the ocean, they do not make sense. So, but yes, they are. I mean, this as well as deploying um, Deploying mirrors in space or injecting uh, uh, sulfate aerosols in the high atmosphere because this is what happens when, when you have a, 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 a volcanic eruption are solutions that the US is paying for now uh, in order to continue to live as they live today and to capture CO2 from the atmosphere and to lower the temperature. So it has to be seriously considered, but it's not a serious solution. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, there are some solutions in the ocean. It's essentially iron, uh, uh, iron um, fertiliz fertilization, as far as I can say. Maybe, maybe there are some other things, but uh, yeah, I think there is something about also putting some turbines in the ocean to to try to, to make the movement more quicker so that you can absorb CO2 and then put the, the CO2 uh, in, the, in, in the deep sea very quickly and take another one, etc. But it's geoengineering. It's, um, it, ha it has to be taken cautiously, I think. Um, so my name is Ahmed. I'm from Pakistan. Um, First and foremost, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. And uh, I actually learned a lot today ab about some things that I didn't knew. Um, so my <laughs> concern is a bit uh, micro when you stated like uh, the capacity of a land or soil to absorb CO2. So I was just wondering because there's a debate going on uh, about like agricultural land losing its um, nutritional value. So the question is when like with the modern agriculture practice, practices that's been happening and uh, the rising temperature, does it impact that too or uh, is that completely separate? Does it impact what the, the, the capacity of land, agriculture land or the land to absorb CO2? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why we, there, are, there is a, a, a huge movement to move towards what we call agroecology. Uh, it's yes, because the monoculture, the fact of uh, pl plowing the, the land, uh, of removing any, any biological matter out, exporting all the biological matter, uh, um, make your soil uh, uh, poorer and poorer. So we need to have more organic soils. So we need to leave uh, dead material on the soil. We need to stop plowing so that we don't accelerate the respiration of the soil. We need to, to combine different vegetation types, di different uh, seeds, in order to make this, the agriculture, more resilient. So we know how, what to do, in fact. We, we really know what to do. And the, the problem in the developed countries is all the, what you do with what you harvest after. 
It's all the organization of where you transport the food, how it is transfor transformed. That's the, 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 big, the bad part. But, but what to do? We know what to do to store more carbon in the agricultural soil and to make the, uh, uh, the agricultural production more resilient. But we have to change some habits. We have to change the chaining between the, trans the, the, the harvest, the transports, the transformation. Also, uh, in developed countries, the way we feed ourselves, uh, because we need to change things. I mean, then we need to go from corn to sorgo, for example. That's the easiest thing, but uh, European eating sorgo is something that is not you have to change your, uh, your taste, etc. So there, we, we know what to do, but it's the, it's the entire societal behavior that, I mean, uh, uh, economic and societal behavior that need to be changed. And that takes time. But yes, it's uh, the agricultural, um, so, so emits a lot of, it's, uh, so the agricultural world today emits about 13% of the CO2. It's through deforestation, essentially, okay? But then it emits 44% of the methane through uh, 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 breeding, uh, uh, through the, the um, ah, l'élevage, livestock, yeah. livestock, through livestock and, and through uh, uh, rice cultivation. And 82% of uh, N2O emissions, which is 200 times more powerful to warm the, 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 the planet than CO2, uh, through all our mineral fertilizers. So, uh, and we know how to change all that, but we just don't do it for the moment. Because, again, it's an entire chain that, that we as climate scientists do not, do not handle. I mean, we have no, no clue on how to do that. So it's political decision, but it's not just political decision. It goes beyond that. It's really uh, big companies and uh, it's, 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 I think it's complicated, at least in our, our country. Uh, hi, my name is Jocelyn from Costa Rica. I must tell in advance that maybe my question is too naive, but in the graphic that you presented before, uh, you were like explaining the roots uh, that the, the climate change is going to take depending mm -hmm. on how the human behavior is going to, to be. Usually uh, the, the political solutions uh, that they are like trying to offer is like the transformation of the energetic um, to to go to to cleaner energies, right? Uh, but what I have s seen is that usually you have like more clean energy, so you have you are allowed to produce more and to increase your consumption. Mm. So same thing with ir irrigation. Huh? Yes. So is this taken into account in the in the analysis that you made? And you think that energies, clean energies, are enough to reach? these goals or we should be like changing our discourse to a more like diminish the consumption instead of like I, I okay, don't know uh, if I yeah, was yeah, clear. I, I think I get your point. Um, so as a physicist and a climate scientist, I don't know. Okay. Mm -hmm. But in the in the third report the third group of IPCC they have looked at this and that's for sure the conclusion now is that it's uh, uh, Sobriété, so, so sufficiency. No, sufficiency, c'est pas sobriété. Sobriety. Sober, huh? Sobriety. Sobriety. Mm -hmm. exists. Okay. Um, it's really uh, what you say is that yes, of course, there is a the ten, there is this um, this paradox is that the the more you make things efficient, in fact, the more you use them. Okay, it's true for irrigation, it's true for energy, and it's true for many other things. And you are right, we don't need just to increase the efficiency, we also need to lower our consumption of food, energy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, at the global scale, and especially in the develop developed countries. Of course, not in developing countries where they still need to make a, a route uh, and, 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 uh, and have more, um, more uh, time to, to, to make their, their change. Uh, but yes, no, no, we need, we need towards, to really move towards uh, uh, diminishing uh, the, our standards in a way. And that's clearly written in the last IPCC report. 
Hi, thanks for your presentation. I'm Aurélien from France, and I wanted to ask you, like, uh, it's on the relevance of the concept of Anthropocene, because mm. if we look at how the impact on the Earth system is distributed across the world, we can see, for example, that 50% uh, of uh, greenhouse gases emissions come from just the top 10% of the population, yep. and it's the contrary. Like, uh, the 50 mm poorest person have the uh, just emit like 10 percent of uh, greenhouse gases emissions and if we so it's core countries that are producing these emissions and if we look historically at how this happened it's basically core countries that shifted from an agricultural metabolism to a fossil metabolism in the 19th century mm. so uh, some scholars are saying that this shift is not caused by humanity as a whole but by a given social system which is called capitalism mm. and that mm. produced that uh, metabolic metabolic rift in the 19th century and so they talk about uh, capitalocene instead of anthropocene mm. and so i would like yeah. to know what is your position or, on this or what is the position of the climate scientist on that difference between anthropocene and capitalocene you realize that i totally out of my comfort zone <laughs> <laughs> totally out so i don't know we don't we do we cannot even debate on that because we have no idea in fact I don't, we, we really do not manipulate, we, we, I heard the same as you and I read the same, but I don't, I don't have the knowledge at all to be able to, to give something else than just an opinion, which I will not. <laughs> <laughs> last two questions, one and one. Sorry, <laughs> but you are right, it's nice that you put this forward. Uh, I'm Antoine from France. I have a question that maybe you will be more in, in comfort zone. <laughs> it's a technical <laughs> question. Uh, could you develop a bit more because I didn't understand the, the role of plants and vegetation ah, uh, in the right, relation with the climate? Um, because I've heard that it is great to have uh, plants like here in, in, in cities, but at the same time I was wondering if the um, humid uh, heat wave problem that happens usually in the um, equatorial areas uh, with the usually a lot of vegetation. So I, I, I don't know, I yeah, know yeah, if it's yeah. like the, yeah, the, the, the interaction. Of, uh, okay, so, so apart from CO2, the plant, in fact, it's, it, it uses energy and redistributes energy. So it captures uh, uh, solar energy and then it, ch it transforms it into transpiration or um, what we call sensible convection, in fact, convection, heat convection. You are over a sandy area you feel the heat coming from the ground, like if you were putting your convector heater on at, your, at home, you feel the heat below, okay? Because it's, uh, it's taking, it's taking the, the, the heat back. Uh, then it, um, uh, with a transpiring plant, it's, it's transpiration. So it's water vapor. And this water vapor is sent at the upper atmosphere. I'll come back to the humidity. So it, it changes humidity. So in fact, it cools the ground. And when you have in temperate regions, a more humid uh, vegetation that is transpiring. In fact, what the resultant is that you, you extract more energy from your soil for transpiration, and the soil and also the atmosphere that you breathe is much cooler. And we do not reach very high temperatures for the moment, so in fact, the combination with humidity is negligible. Okay? So in fact, it's really the plant, it's, it's just the way it redistributes water and energy. Then uh, the question is whether, um, whether a green area in, in the tropical monsoon region is going to, uh, to increase the humidity in a way that is going to make you more suffer. I don't think so, because most of the humidity that we get during those very humid periods do not come from vegetation. It comes from the water vapor that is evacuated from the ocean. And in fact, vegetation does not transpire a lot during those events. So they can open their stomata, the pore that they have at their leaves, and they can capture the CO2 and grow without losing their... Because the plant, it, 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 um, it, uh, it, it, it plays a trade-off between... So, so those stomata, like the pore that we have at the surface of our skin when we, when we sweat, for them, when they open, it's because they can have CO2 coming in, and they can eat, and then they can grow. But when they open this, because it's, it's moist inside, they lose the water by transpiration. And they have a trade-off between how much water I'm going to lose, which will put me in desiccation, 
and I need to have my roots to pull up water from the soil and to bring it up to the leaf, and how much uh, in CO2 I can have in. So it's a trade-off all the time. So when the atmosphere is very wet, that's okay. It can over in some it's not going to lose any water. The atmosphere is not demanding water, and so it can have a lot of CO2 coming in. It's the problem is when it's starting to be dry and the atmosphere is dry. So in fact, putting a plant I, I, is not going to accentuate the stress, the heat stress, but it's going to cool your surface so much that this is what, what is going to be winning, in fact. I don't know whether it's very, very quickly. Um, thank you for the presentation. I'm uh, Kushi, and I'm from India. Uh, my question was related to how you talked about imagining, let's say, tomorrow's societies and how there is a need for, let's say, behavior change, particularly you mentioned food habits. So I wanted to talk about how, let's say, the entire debate about veganism or else or let's say no flight, mo no flight uh, movement. So a lot of people say that they are very individualistic in the sense that do they actually like create an impact because like the mm. net impact that you're creating is like so small. So does it even matter? So as a climate center, uh, what do you think about this? As in, um, do you think it like actually leads to something or is it just a way to, let's say, make you feel better, make yourself feel better about, you know, that you're doing something for it? Well, I think every individual action matters. That's my answer. Every individual action matters. So any time you take a flight and you feel, you feel good, I mean, another one is going to take one and feel good, etc., etc. So at the same time, you cannot stop the world from fu functioning. So I doubt that we will stop completely flying. But I think every uh, decision has to be thought about and every individual, every company, everyone has to think about, okay, what can I do at my level? And we as climate scientists, we use supercomputers. That's enormous consumption of energy. We have, we want to increase the resolution of our climate model because now it's 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer and that's one homogeneous uh, uh, spot, which we know it's not. And so we want to increase that enormous amount of data to be stored. And that, of course, is data centers. It's a lot of energy. So we, we are thinking when we go and we go in the, in, the, in the deep ocean to drill the deep ocean to go back to climate, understand past climate change, or in, uh, in uh, Greenland or in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in Antarctica to, to, to drill the ice, that's energy, that's flights, that's boats. So we, and we are thinking about what, shall we stop something? Shall we stop gr growing our knowledge in a way or how can we change? We all need to think. So I think there is no, there is no hiding behind, oh no, I, it, it, it's not going to play a big role. It's like French people who say, well, France, well, it's just 1% of total emissions. Okay, but it's number seven in historical responsibility. Okay, because it's cumulative. It's not what we are emitting today. It's what we've been emitting. And in terms of responsibility at the global scale, we are number seven, which, which puts us very high on the responsibility level. So, so every individual must think. And I mean, it's not just to, to, to show and say you are a bad person. It's just to, 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 to think about our actions. And, and, and for everyone, we ask the companies, we ask the individuals, we ask our practices in terms of scientists. We need to think about it and, and, and think collectively in order to find the right solution and the right decisions. If we want to stop at plus two degrees C of warming and we think we are comfortable with it, why not? But we need to take a, a conscious deci decision and to know and to be able to help the people who cannot live at this level of level of temperature. As I told you earlier, some islands have already disappeared and will continue to disappear. So that's massive amount of people uh, that, that are going to have to move. So who is going to welcome them? It's, it's a collective thinking. So it's, uh, I, I tend to dislike this kind of hiding behind uh, my little. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nathalie. Thank you.